Okay, let's get started. Are there any questions about anything? I'm sure someone somewhere in the world is asking some questions, so the answer to that question is yes. But are there any questions from anyone in here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the supplement I saw on the website, we can use like a little bit more, like it's only going to be 30 minutes instead of 50. Yes. Yep. Uh, uh, not uh, so. It's not going to be as long, but five programming questions. Yeah. Other questions. Yeah. Or no. Uh, so uh, midterm twos are still here. This will be the last day that you can pick them up. Otherwise, you'll have to go to my office hours. So pick them up if you haven't picked them up. But yeah, go ahead. Yep, so it, exactly the same topics as exam two, uh, midterm two. And um, so you won't see any of the questions from the actual for second midterm on the supplement, but it's the exact same topics. So you should be expecting to see things on functions, things on classes, and things on uh, arrays, vectors, that sort of thing. So you should expect to see those questions. So there should be no surprise at all. Other questions? And, and remember, it's completely optional. You do not have to take it. Oh, yeah. You do not, you're not compelled to take it. But if there are no other questions, we can continue. So what were we talking about starting last time? Sorting, right. So, so why do we want to sort things? Ah, yeah. So what, uh, if I have a list that's sorted, what kind of thing becomes much faster as a result? Searching and well, specifically what type of searching? Uh, binary searching, which is cutting the list in half and searching the appropriate piece. Yeah. So we want to know how to sort data. So um, you can sort data in gazillions of ways. In fact, infinitely many ways. So the, by far the most common are these three, particularly the ascending and descending order um, numerically. But you can, if you have like a list of names, there isn't really like a numeric type order associated with that. So you can do alphabetically. Um, and then what you can do is say, well, if, let's just say we have, um, we, we have two names, Rob, and Robert, okay? So which one should go first? Well, maybe the Rob should go first or the Robert should go first. So maybe like a sorting within a sort, we want to do something. So maybe like they have the same prefix, so they start out the same, but then there's like a difference later on. Like one of them is uh, longer than the other one. Then we can say, well, do we want the longer one next or before the shorter one? So there are many types of sorts that we can do. Um, we can sort strings like on their length. Ignore the alphabetical order. Just sort by length only. So like all of the length one strings go first, then the length two, then length three, then length four. Or maybe we can have a sort where we do that, sort by the length, and then within each length, they're alphabetically sorted. So th there are many things that we can do. Or maybe we have a bunch of student objects where we sort by their name, and then once we sort by the name, then sort by the GPA, GPA, and then sort by student ID, and then sort by this, sort by this. So we can have as complex a sort as we want. But we're going to make it nice and simple here. As long as we can say, I have two things to compare, and I can tell whether one is smaller than the other one. If I can do that, that's all we need. So uh, numeric, you can think of it numerically. So like one number is less than another. So we're going to talk about two uh, sorting algorithms, so bubble and selection sort. But uh, 
uh, just to let you know, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of different sorting algorithms, depending on what type of data that you should use. These, um, these two algorithms are general purpose. They can work with any type of data set, as long as I can say one thing is less than another. But the uh, thing is, if we know that the data that we're dealing with are, say, integers, then I can do a different type of sort uh, called radix sort, which is faster than these two. But if we don't know necessarily what data we're dealing with, then I can't use radix sort or maybe other sorts. So we're just going to stick at a high level and just work with general purpose sorts here. But just know that there are many other ones. So I kind of mentioned the high level idea of bubble sort. So we want to have the list sorted. So if the list is sorted, great, we're done. What if the list is not sorted? What can you find in the list to show to me that the list is not sorted? Two values, uh, two values that are out of order, right? So here's one value. Uh, it's supposed to go over here. And here's another value that's supposed to go over here but they're in the wrong order. So here's the thing. Could they be far apart away from each other? Yeah, yeah they could be far apart. So like I could have a list that's completely de uh, descending order and I want it in ascending order. So I could have like the, the biggest element at the beginning and the smallest element at the end. They're in the wrong order, but they're far apart. But could you find, if a list isn't sorted, could you find two elements out of order that are right next to each other? Yeah. Well, consider that if that's not true, suppose that every pair of adjacent elements is in the right order. Okay? Could it be not sorted? Technically true, but uh, we're just going to uh, stick with, say, numeric order here. Could you have something this less than or equal to this, less than or equal to this, less than or equal to this, blah, 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 to the end, and have it be not in sorted order? No. So uh, here, we're going to take advantage of the fact that if we just look at adjacent elements and, if we, and we see a pair that's in the wrong order, then we need to make some changes. So here's the idea. So we're just going to scan through the array looking for any adjacent pair out of order. If there are no adjacent pairs out of order, what do I know about the list? Sorted. It is sorted. So if we go through and we say, oh, here's a pair that's out of order, what should I do? What we're going to do is we're going to swap them. We're going to flip, uh, put them uh, in the other place. So if we're looking at a pair of elements, this guy is a, a value, say, 100. This one has 10. I'm going to swap them so the second element has 10 and the first one has 100. OK? Um, so if they're out of order, we're going to make a swap. And we're going to go through the entire array. If we made at least one swap all the way through, we're going to go through the list again. And if we go through again and we make another swap, we're going to go through the list again and again and again until we make one pass through the entire thing where we don't make any swaps, which means the list is sorted. So uh, yeah, that's, so that's basically how this works. So you compare the first two elements and exchange if needed. Uh, then you keep moving down, uh, marching your way down the array, and you make swaps as necessary until the end. If you made any swaps at all, you uh, repeat the search through. You repeat another pass through the array. And then you keep going until you make no uh, exchanges. So does this, uh, could this algorithm run forever? Could this sort run forever? Think about what happens. So if I have uh, a pair of elements out of order, then I make a swap by the algorithm which means that the, let's just say we're sorting in ascending order. So this heavy element, the one with high value, is uh, earlier in the list than the one with the lower value. So then we make a swap. But that means that the value that is bigger is moving toward wherever it needs to go. So it's one place closer to where it was. 
the, to where it needs to go. Which means that it's inching along until it eventually gets to the place it needs to. Which means that I can't make it forever keep going in one direction. The list is only a certain number of elements. So this sort can't actually run forever. So let's actually do an example. So let's look at this list right here. Is it, just looking at it, is it sorted in, in ascending order? No, it, well, uh, neither descending either. So here's the, th here's the idea. So we're gonna look at the first two elements, which are what in this case? 17 and 23, are they sorted in ascending order? Yes, perfect. So I do not make a swap here because they are in the right order. Then I march to the next two elements. So which ones am I looking now? 23 and 5. Are they in sorted order? No. So I make a swap. So I swap the 5 and the 23, and then this is the list we have right now. Then I keep going. I look at the next two elements, and I make a swap if necessary. What elements am I looking at? 11 and 23. Should, should I make a swap? Yeah, because the 23 is before the 11, so I make a swap. So this is the list we have now. Am I complete with one pass? Yeah, so I've looked at every uh, pair of adjacent elements. But did I make a swap along the way? Yes. yes. So what should I do now? Or go through another pass. Great. So I look again, look at the first two elements and... Do I make a swap in this case? Yes, because the 17 and 5 are in the wrong order, so I make a swap. Uh, 5 and 17. Uh, 17 and 11, should I make a swap? Yes, so I make a swap. 17 and 23, should I make a swap? No, because they're in the right order. Did I make a swap along the way? Yes, I did, so what should I do? Make another pass, great. 5 and 11, should I swap them? No, 11 and 17, should I swap them? 17 and 23. Oh, did I make a swap along the way? Ah, so what do I know about the list? It's sorted. So, uh, that's pretty cool that um, uh, you can just make these incremental changes to the array and I just move the elements closer to wherever they need to go uh, along the way, and that's all we need to do. So uh, here are some trade-offs for this. It's easy to understand because you just make these passes and make swaps as necessary, and it's easy to implement, and I'll show you some code for that. Um, the thing is, it's inefficient due to the number of exchanges. This makes it slow for large arrays, and that is true. What about small arrays? Is this claim true for small arrays necessarily? No. So uh, for large arrays, it ends up being slow. And I, I recommend you actually trying it out to see how slow it actually gets. But it, it really does become slow. So uh, I'll show you some code for this. So uh, here is some code for um, uh, bubble sort. So we have. Uh, an integer array right here. Uh, there's just this handy function called show array, which just prints the contents of the array. We don't really care about that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to call this sort array uh, function, and it does uh, bubble sort. So let's see it in action here. So here's the idea. So we're Am I always going to make at least one pass through the array? Yes. Yeah. So what loop should I use? Always at least once. A do while. I shouldn't make a while loop in this case because I'm guaranteed to, I, I should run through the list at least once. So we have a do while loop here. So um, there's actually a small bug in this code. What is the value swap? It's not initialized. So could it be false? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the good thing is here that we initialize it here. But should you initialize it with a value up here? Yeah. Yes. So this code comes from the publisher, not me. So professional people make mistakes like this. 
Don't make mistakes like that. Okay, so there's really no issue though because we set it right after anyway. So here's the idea. So we're going. So this for loop right here is looking through. So we're looking at adjacent indices. Remember, so an index i and an index i plus one. So in order for the second one to be valid, I need the first one to be not going up to the last index possible, but the last index minus one, so that I have room for the second index here. So that's why we have the strictly less than size minus one right here. So all it does is uh, the outer for loop is, uh, well, the only for loop, it marches through the array. That's all it does. Then it says, if the array at the first index right here, count, is strictly larger than the adjacent one right after it. So if it's strictly larger, then what do you think these three lines of code do? It, it does the swap. Could I say, uh, I'm just going to ignore these two, and I'm going to say uh, array of count plus one equals like this? Right. So whatever was in the plus one uh, index, I just lost it, whatever it was. So in fact, we do need a temp variable right here. There's a, there's a different way you can go, but yeah. Is the different way you could go using a comma to put them all on the same line? Because I've seen that in different kind of programming languages. You can put a comma on yeah. the left side of each one and swap them on the other side. You can't in C++, but you can in Python. Yes. So what he is asking is, um, could I uh, do something like this? So basically what we're doing is we're doing a simultaneous uh, a value change. So, uh, so don't do this because it's not valid C++, but I'm just showing you what other languages are capable of. Uh, so the count plus one index would go into the count index, and the count index is going into the count plus one. In other words, we're doing a swap. Yeah, so that's actually the other way to go. So there's this really, really handy function for doing exactly this. So let's do uh, look up standard swap, and I'll show you what it looks like. So unfortunately, you need to include a different header in order to use it, but uh, it's a really handy function if it'll ever load. OK, yeah. So. Uh, so basically, this is the idea. Ignore this template thingy. Uh, we'll get to templates, hopefully, sometime. But look at this. It says, uh, here's the swap function. What does it return? Nothing. Nothing. And what does it take as arguments? Ignore the t. So pass by reference to? Pass by reference to two things, a, two variables a and b. So what does it actually do? It swaps the values a and b. Oh, that's exactly what we want. So what you could actually do instead is ignore this nonsense. Uh, include, so you need the algorithm header for, for this in, in order to use swap, unfortunately. Although it's simple enough to write, so it's not that bad. So then you say swap array of count, array of count plus one. Isn't that a lot easier? Yeah. So uh, I highly recommend doing this uh, because uh, if you want to swap two values, uh, uh, because it's guaranteed to be much uh, much more efficient actually than doing these three. Um, uh, but you can do these three. So I'm just going to leave it like this. So let's just say we do the swap like this. What do you think this is right here for? It sets the bool to true. Why do we set it to true there? Ah, so, so let's just say we go through the entire array right here. I loop through the entire thing, and I find, oh, swap was true at this point. What does that mean? 
No, no, no. Uh, in terms of what we saw when we went through the array. That we had to make a swap. Why? Because we set it to false at the beginning and it's only set to true if we actually do make a swap, which is exactly how the bubble sort algorithm works. If we made any swap at all along the way, we're going to make another pass. So uh, we set it to true, and we keep going while swap is still set to true, meaning we saw we swapped two values along the way. And that's the whole algorithm. So what is it, like 10 lines? So this is not very hard to implement. Uh, but are there any questions on it? Uh, I'll give you this code too. Yeah. With that, um, that algorithm header, there's like built in ways to do a lot of these like functions that actually just do the sorts. Yeah, so there's a, yeah, so there are many, many, many functions. So there's actually one called sort. <laughs> so there, there is a built in function to sort for you. So all of this is kind of moot anyway. Um, in fact, for uh, when I taught this class last time, what I did was, remember the example that I did for searches where we compared linear versus binary search for long lists and short lists? I made an assignment which is comparing a, a, a bubble sort, selection sort, and this sort in the standard library to check uh, which ones are better? And does it depend on the list itself? So like if I have everything in ascending, so let's actually look at the um, bubble sort algorithm. Suppose that the list is already sorted. Is this algorithm fast? Yeah. Yeah, because it only makes exactly one pass through the array. What if it's completely in the wrong order, completely descending order? Is this slow? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you know that like it's 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 sort in the wrong order. The thing that is uh, the lowest value is all the way at the end. You know it has to go at the front, and you know that the thing at the front has to go all the way to the back. So, for different types of lists, some algorithms can be much faster or slower depending on what the list is. So, but. This algorithm does work, so there's nothing wrong with the algorithm. It's just that it's slow for some lists. Um, and even if there's exactly one mismatched pair along the way, then you're still going to have to make at least two passes along with bubble sort here. So uh, there are a lot of things that uh, researchers have looked into. Like, um, if I know how many swaps I will need to make eventually, how fast can I actually make a sorting algorithm? So if I know that there are like 10 swaps that I need to make, uh, how fast can I detect what those are? So uh, it really depends on what uh, list you're dealing with. With a general purpose thing, uh, uh, bubble sort works. But it kind of irks you. If you have this, so this is a great segue, so thank you. Um, if you have the list completely in descending order and you want it in ascending order, so for like the biggest element or even the smallest one, you know where it's going to go eventually. Shouldn't we design an algorithm that you look at the smallest element of things not sorted and move it to where it needs to go? So like if we have, um, let's actually just look at the list right here. So. Let's just say I, I swap these two for now. So, so the first two values are sorted. Two and seven are sorted. Three is not. Where does the three need to go? Uh, between the two and the three, like this. So let's just say we go through dot, 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 and we see, oh, here's a one right here. Where does it need to go? All the way at the front. Well, with bubble sort, if we just went through this, I'd have to make one complete pass to have the one move down one position, and then another pass to make it move one position further. Couldn't we just have the algorithm move it all at once to where it needs to go? So that is the idea of selection sort. 
although it's slow too, so uh, it's kind of moot also. But this is the idea. So we have an arbitrary list. Just look at the first element. Is it by itself sorted? Seems like a trick question. Yeah. Is a one element list sorted? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so th that's not terrible to uh, figure out. So the thing at index zero is sorted. What about the thing at index one with the index zero thing? Could they be in the wrong order possibly? Yeah, yeah possibly. So what you do is uh, you move index one to wherever it needs to go. Either it stays where it needs where it is right now, or you move it to index zero. So then what you do is now index zero and index one are both sorted. You look now at index two, and then you move it to wherever it needs to go in this list that you, you're maintaining right now. So either keep it where it is, move it to index one, or move it to index zero and move the others accordingly. For index three, you move it to wherever it needs to go. And then at each point, the list that you're maintaining, you guarantee to be sorted because you're just moving it wherever it needs to go. So for index four, you move it to wherever it needs to go. Index five, move it, move, it, move index six, et cetera, all the way through the array. So that's the idea. Instead of having to make these complete passes just to move things by one position, just move it all at once to wherever it needs to go. So that's the idea. So let's look at this list right here. So, it are, so look at 11 only, just 11. Is it sorted by itself? Yeah, great. So now we're maintaining the first uh, index zero. That thing is sorted. So we're done with just index zero. Now we're looking at the range index zero to index one. Is that sorted? No. no. Well, it, it doesn't even matter. Uh, where does index, where's, sorry, where does the value two have to go? To, to the beginning. And you know that because uh, this pair is in the wrong order. So uh, what you're going to do is you're going to move it down, kind of like bubble sort, but you're doing a lot of swaps at once. So uh, you move it to wherever it needs to go. So that means you do a swap here. So then now they're in the right order. So index 0 and index 1 are both in the right order. Great. Now we look at uh, we look at the second index, index two right here. So where does it need to go? It, well, right where it is. The 29 doesn't have to move because it's in the right position. So how do you know that it's in the right position? Well, it is greater than the previous two, but which one do I only need to check? The one right before it. Because what do I know about the first two indices? They're sorted. So I only have to check the last one, which is kind of cool. So they are in the right order. So let's see. Oh my goodness. I've been teaching you the wrong algorithm. Sorry. Let's, let's restart. Uh, I was actually showing you a completely different algorithm that's better than selection sort. Sorry. <laughs> Restart. So the, the, the idea is, is good, though, that uh, we're maintaining a list that's sorted. Wow, that was quite an error. Uh, what you do is you look at the, last, the, the next index that's not in your currently sorted list. And then what you do is you exchange it with the last thing in the entire list. Uh, yeah, so here's what you do. Uh, you look at 11, 11 is okay. You look after 11 to the smallest, in, the smallest value not in this list right here. So the list only has 11 in it. What is the smallest element in that list? 11. So what is the smallest element uh, not in this list 11? Two. So then what you do is you swap those two indices. Uh, the, those two values, sorry. So you swap them. Now the list is 11 and 2 right here. So uh, what you do now is 
uh, let's see. So you exchange two with the element as subscript zero. So wherever it needs to go. So now you look in the smallest element that's not in this list two right here. And then you exchange it with, well, the 11 could be in the right place, but do we know that it's in the right place or not? No, we don't know. Is two in the right place? Yes. So we look through the rest of the list after the value two, looking for the smallest element. What is the smallest element other than the two? Three. So we know that the three must go at index one because it's the smallest thing so far after the value two right here. So we see, okay, three is here. I'm just going to swap it with wherever it needs to go, which is the 11 right here. So that's what we do here. So we make a swap right here because the three has to go in this index one position and the 11, well, we're just going to move it to the end. Well, the two and three are okay now. So then we see, okay, uh, I don't know if 29 needs to go there, but the smallest element among these two, 29 and 11, is 11. So then we make a swap. So the 11 needs to go here. Uh, what about the last index? Is the last index sorted just by itself? Yeah. So in fact, this list is sorted now. So uh, what you're doing in a sense is you're, you're doing something like bubble sort, but in a different order. So what you're doing here is you're scanning through the list, looking for the thing that should go at the next index, and then doing a swap there. So instead of doing like a whole bunch of swaps along the way, you're doing a big scan over the list and then doing one swap instead of many swaps. So if swapping things is uh, expensive to do, which algorithm should you use? Should you use bubble sort or selection sort if swaps are expensive? Selection sort, because you're doing fewer swaps. But the essentially both algorithms are both slow because for each one of those big swaps that you're making, you still have to sort, you have to search through the entire list looking for the smallest element. So that makes it kind of slow, yeah. But then eventually wouldn't you be doing the same amount of like swaps in both of them, but the only difference being that in selection sort you don't keep running through it again and again? So it goes back to the definition of what a swap is. So uh, technically, selection sort does fewer swaps. But the number of positions that change as a result of swapping is identical. Um, and uh, there's a way that you can prove that. But the key here is that selection sort does fewer swaps. So uh, if you're curious, the algorithm that I was teaching you, even before I caught myself, is called insertion sort. Um, I won't test you on insertion sort. So uh, selection sort is more efficient because you do fewer swaps. Um, the thing is, we're going to get into stuff soon, where uh, bubble sort and selection sort, in terms of how long they run, they're effectively the same. So even though it does fewer number of exchanges, um, they're essentially the same horrible runtime. So uh, we'll get to that soon. But if exchanges are expensive, you want to use selection sort. Great final exam question, by the way. Um, yeah. So the cool thing is, though, um, other than the list itself, what do the algorithms actually need? Uh, what other things do the algorithms need to know? So let's go back to uh, uh, bubble sort. So what things do I maintain in here? Well, let's see. Well, I have an integer here, integer and a Boolean here, and like an integer here, and I'm swapping values. So like three integers uh, and one Boolean. So the overhead here for uh, bubble sort is actually pretty small. So if I have a 10 million element list, I only have an overhead of like three elements, uh, three integers. And that's like nothing. So, and for selection sort, which I have here, 
uh, it's the same thing if you just look at the code. So like I have three integers here. Okay, four integers. So uh, one of them is worse, I guess. But there's very, very little overhead. So uh, that's one of the upsides of using one of these algorithms is that they have very little overhead compared to the actual size of the list. Okay. Uh, actually, let's go through the code for it. So, uh, so this outer loop right here just does a scan, one scan. So there's no do while loop here. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, uh, so this will tell you at a high level uh, how far in your list is sorted so far. So at the beginning, the first element is sorted by itself. Um, but after we make the swap with the smallest element in the list. And then after that, once we make the one swap, then we know the first element is sorted in the right order. Then we look through the rest of the elements, find the smallest, and move it to the second position. And so the outer, in, outer loop just says uh, how much of your list is sorted so far. The second loop goes through the rest of the array and finds the smallest element. So if you look here, uh, we find what the minimum index is and what the minimum value is. So then in here we just maintain what is the minimum value and corresponding index. And then what we do here is we uh, effectively make a swap. So with this line up here at the start of the min value and these two down here, we're actually making a swap here. Okay. Uh, any questions about selection or bubble sort? Okay, so you may be wondering then, uh, I have uh, bubble sort and selection sort, or maybe some other sort, doesn't matter. Or in general, I have uh, an algorithm here and another algorithm to solve the exact same problem. And maybe you know some things about uh, what types of inputs you should uh, expect. Should you expect integers or strings or whatever? The question you have to answer yourself is, which algorithm should I use? Should I use this one or this one? And uh, there are different trade-offs of using one or another. Rarely do you ever have the case where one is always better in every possible case. And we actually saw that. With linear and binary search, what did we see? Yeah, for, for short lists, we saw that linear search sometimes runs faster. For long lists, what did we see? Yeah, yeah, it's not necessarily. In fact, binary search was way faster for those lists compared to uh, linear search. So. And it seems kind of intuitive, like if you have a ton of elements and you are cutting the list in half every single time, then uh, you're making many fewer searches than the linear search does. But if the list is small, that difference is much smaller. So if we have two algorithms to solve a problem, what makes one better? So there are a lot of different things you can look at. The one that we're going to care about more often than not is time. So how long does an algorithm take? So, uh, but maybe you want to care more about how much space an algorithm takes. For, th for things like big data, where maybe you are uh, listening to all tweets that are ever tweeted at, uh, currently right now, it's just streaming by you. Could you store all of that? You could, but uh, you'll start needing like terabytes of data pretty quickly. So what you need to do in that case is you're going to only have one pass over the data and you can't store any of it. So could you have an algorithm that uses a small amount of space and only looks at the data once? So like things like uh, com uh, computing the average of something. Uh, you don't need to look over the list more than once, and you don't need to store much in addition to the list. So sometimes you do care about that, but we're going to care more about time. Yeah? So for like, the 
Assignment six would be a pretty good example of that as well, because you're like you're reading the inputs from a list of words, and you don't you don't want to store a vector of every single word in that dictionary. Right. You just want to you want to measure and make observations for each string as it comes in, and make determinations, and then store it if it meets the determinations. Right. So for like assignment six, as he was saying, um, you have this list of several hundred thousand words. You could store this into a vector if you wanted to, but uh, that'll take a relatively large amount of memory to do, and so it may not be as fast to if you just store everything into a vector and then do some work on it. Whereas if you're just reading through the file and not actually storing all the words all at once, that could be a lot better. So it depends on what type of algorithm you want to actually use. Um, so what we're going to do is a somewhat brief introduction to how do we analyze algorithms. So how could I say that one algorithm is better than the other at this particular problem? Or um, this algorithm is worse than this one, but it's better in this way than this other one. So there's like a trade-off between the two. So uh, that's what al analysis of algorithms is for. So what we're going to look at are computational problems. So uh, we have some problem that we want to solve, and we have an algorithm to solve it. Okay. So a uh, computational problem is any problem solved by an algorithm. Oops. So an example of this would be like assignment six. Look through all the list of words here. Find, look through all English words and find one with the highest urgency. So that would be a computational problem. Uh, here's a problem. I want to find the word with the highest urgency. And an algorithm would be look through all the words, figure out whether each one is OK uh, uh, with the input by the user. And among all the ones that are OK, find the one with highest urgency. That would be an algorithm to solve that problem. So. An instance of the problem is a specific uh, problem so that, that is solved by the algorithm. So an example of that would be when we did this uh, example with the list up here with uh, um, uh, bubble sort. This list itself, that is an instance. So it's not just like an arbitrary list. It's a specific list that we're working with. So that would be an instance uh, to the problem. So it's something that the problem expects. So if the problem says, um, take this integer and factorize it into primes or something, uh, could a string be an instance to that problem? It's not a trick question. Is expecting an integer, is a string a valid input? No. So uh, that would not be an instance. But if I gave it an, an integer, that is an instance. Okay? So it's just something that could be presented uh, to the problem or to the algorithm. The size of the instance is how much memory do you need to store this thing? So like for if you have like 100 integers, the size of that would be 100 integers times 4 bytes each. So 400 bytes would be the size of that instance. Uh, and then uh, most crucially is something called a basic step. So we're not going to actually make this precise. Um, there are other classes that you can take that will make this precise. Um, but basic, basically is a very small operation that can be done quickly. So like incrementing an integer or multiplying two integers or comparing something against something else those are basic steps. So something that you can't really break down into something smaller. So it's like, it's like, it's something called like an atomic unit sometimes. It's something that you can't break up into smaller pieces. So those are basic steps. So like exchange two variables or, or compare two things or, and this one is not an example of a basic step. Find the largest element of an array. Why is that not a basic step? It's multiple steps. Look at this value, then look at this one, then look at this one, 
all the way through. So that is not a basic step because it has multiple steps with it. Okay, so we want to understand uh, how long does an algorithm take, for example. But this could be made for any type of measure you want to look at, space or whatever else. So the complexity of an algorithm is how many basic steps does it take? So does it take uh, 100 steps? times the size of the list or 10,000 steps for times the size of the list or whatever. Uh, it's how long the algorithm takes depending on the size of the instance. So if you give it 10,000 elements as a list, as an input, you should be able to figure out how long, how many number of basic steps it should take to run on that particular uh, list. But the issue is, uh, look at um, look at binary search for example. Uh, remember what it does, or, or even linear search. So c let's just say we're looking at the middle index, and we find it immediately the value that we're looking for. We find it on the first lookup. So is that fast? No matter how long the list is. Yeah, yeah because I'm only making one basic step, no matter how big the list is. So regardless of how big the list is, uh, the best possible scenario is I can do it in one step. What is the worst case? Uh, find it on the last one, let's just say for linear search, which means if I have n elements in the list, I could be making n lookups of that list. I, can find, I have, may have to wait until the very last element in order to find it. Um, and I can't do better because if I only look at, say, the first n minus 1 things and ignore the last one, it might be that last one. So I can't ignore it there. So the worst case of, say, linear search is the entire list. So if I have a 10,000 element list, I may have to do 10,000 basic steps, no matter what, in that case. But so you may want to care about worst case complexity. And in fact, that's what we're going to look at uh, here. But more realistically, you may want to look at average case complexity. How long does it take on average? What is the problem with... Tr so average case is obviously a better measure because it more realistically depicts uh, how long things will take in practice. Why should I, why would it uh, be harder to analyze the average case compared to the worst case? Well, well, well averages could be inconsistent, but think about this. For worst case, say for that, the linear search example that I did, I only have to give you one example of a list to show you, you have to go through the entire list in this case. For average case, what do I have to do? I have to show you every single possible list you could ever have and divide it by how many such lists there are to find the average. So average case complexity is way harder to analyze than worst case is. So worst case is a lot easier to understand uh, and to analyze. Average case is better for like making uh, guarantees and such but it's a lot harder to analyze. Okay, so I'm just gonna do this example really quickly and then we'll quit for today. So here is an example of finding the largest value in the array. So what is the worst case? Ignore what's on the slide. What is the worst case complexity of finding the largest element in the array? Yeah, the size of the array. Could it be that uh, the largest element is the very last one? Yeah, it could be. So I may have to find that, uh, go through the entire list in order to find it. Well, suppose that like the largest element is 100 and it is the last one, and I see 50 along the way. Do I know right then and there it's the largest element? No. Even if, it's, even if it is the largest element, do I know that it is? No. So in fact, I have to go through the entire list. For that reason, what is the average case complexity? The it's the same. 
So for that reason, uh, here's the algorithm here. These two lines up here execute exactly once, so one basic step. This while loop, um, so there's a bug in this. We'll get to that next time. But this while loop will uh, iterate n times. And then there are, say, four steps in here or two or whatever. Some number of steps in here. So then we have n times four, let's say. And then so that's 4n plus whatever basic steps. And so we'll talk about that next time.